This is the old garment district of San Francisco, where once upon a time the clatter of sewing machines would drown out the traffic on the street. The clatter is quieter now, yet it's being heard all over the world. The sweatshops of the garment district have become the editorial offices of a new type of magazine. A magazine you won't find in any conventional newsstand. It exists only on the world's largest computer network, the Internet. What you're seeing here is the future of communications. For this is truly the dawning of a new age, an age where people from all over the world can gather for a simple chat or exchange information and ideas in any site they choose to invent. And here, they've invented an imaginary cultural center. When we are having a speaker, we have a second room, which is an auditorium, where you can hear the speaker, you can pass questions to the moderator, um, but you can't talk to anybody else because it's the auditorium. We prefer to quiet in there. And then there's an adjunct room, which is a cafe, where you can hear the speakers, but you can also talk to everybody else. So those, that's probably the best place to be because <laughs> you can get not only the information from the speaker, but uh, an exciting dynamic um, of readers as well. The foyer, the auditorium, and the cafe exist only in cyberspace. They exist only because we choose to believe they exist. They have an address, and therefore they are. Editor Julie Peterson isn't concerned that the other people inhabiting this space might physically be in Australia, or England, or Nova Scotia, or just down the coast in Los Angeles. Distance is irrelevant on the internet, a mere detail. For here, there are no borders, no boundaries, no guards, no long distance charges. What we're witnessing here is a technological advance as revolutionary as the printing press, the telephone, or television. For when historians look back on the latter half of the 20th century, it might well be remembered less as the time when man walked on the moon, and more as the time we gave birth to the internet. It's almost impossible to get an accurate number of the people who already use the internet, but it's thought to be around 30 million. The statisticians would have us believe that if it keeps growing at its present rate, everyone in the world will be on it by the year 2003. It is perhaps the only phenomenon of our time that is growing faster than the national debt. Tony Witowski, executive editor of the Internet Society, believes the best way to measure the growth is to count the number of what are known as computer hosts. In the internet world, a host is literally just a computer directly attached to the internet. And that number has actually been fairly reliably measured for the last 15 years and is one of the most marvelously exponential kinds of curves. And the, the current number of attached computers is uh, about 4 million. And the interesting thing is that rate, that curve projected out until the end of the decade, and relatively re reliably so, in other words, taking the average over the last four and a half years, indicates there will be 187 million hosts connected computers by the end of the decade. 187 million computers interconnected and intercommunicating with each other. Even with just two or three people on each computer, we're dealing with a potential internet population larger than the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The only difference might be that this population actually talks to each other. Some decades from now, when historians reflect back upon this period of time, it'll be regarded as a major turning point, I think, in, in human communications, more so than the Gutenberg printing press, because the printing press actually, on only a fairly limited scale, allowed basically a few people to broadcast information to other people. The internet, by virtue of its ability to mesh what will be hundreds of millions of people together in sort of what I call flat information space, is a kind of a profoundly different capability that by and large human beings have not had before. So Rutowski believes that the internet has the capacity to create and maintain world peace. It wasn't exactly the original concept. It can no longer concern the great powers alone. For a new 
quickly a disaster could well engulf the great and the small. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. The sad truth is that the internet was the product of Cold War paranoia. At the height of the nuclear tension between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Pentagon wanted a system where the generals could continue to communicate with each other if we became the first victims of a nuclear attack. They wanted to be sure that they could still give orders after the rest of us had been blown to bits. This was the late 1950s and early 60s, and long before computers were an everyday occurrence. Only one man came up with a concept that would work. It was, of course, immediately rejected. It came from a 38-year-old computer scientist named Paul Barron. The 60s was a crazy period. It was the height of the Cold War, early 60s. Uh, we had these uh, two major powers with lots of thermonuclear weapons aimed at one another. And uh, the issue of great concern was that of command and control that uh, whichever side fired its weapons first uh, would be at an at a, at advantage because the communication of the other side would be totally destroyed. So uh, as a techie, I thought that the thing that we should concentrate on was coming up with a communication system that could survive the physical attack so one wouldn't have the same propensity to, to want to go first. And um, the problem was that we didn't build communications networks in a manner that allowed this. Everything was highly centralized. So you knock out one spot and the whole network came apart. So the idea was, well, could we build a network like a fishnet? We first looked at that and found such a network could survive. Whatever pieces were left could reconstitute themselves and keep on going as a uh, a coherent operating network. Uh, the kicker was we didn't know how to do it. Barron discovered that while the concept of a fishnet would survive an attack, it wouldn't guarantee that a message would be able to find its way through the net and still be strong when it arrived at the end of it. So we uh, scratched our heads in that and decided A, it would have to be a digital system. And then the, the information would have to find its own way through the network. And uh, so we chopped up information in little bundles called message blocks at the time. Uh, uh, Don Davies of the National Physical Laboratory in England later came up with the name packet switching, and it's a much better name. Uh, so the, the idea there was uh, to uh, create a communication structure uh, organized more like the brain or fishnet where there's no central point and information can flow by any path. And uh, this was met with great skepticism and uh, people in the communications business uh, uh, were very divided. Uh, anybody with a lot of experience in analog was absolutely certain it couldn't work and this was fraud. Barron's fraud did not impress the Pentagon. It was simply too far ahead of its time, for this was long before people knew about digital communications, long before microprocessors. The generals believed that Barron's concept would simply slide off the face of the earth. Barron's 11-volume report was essentially shelved, but the younger engineers realized that he'd hit on the essential idea that could eventually lead to a new form of communications. So was Paul Barron? The grandfather of the internet? You know, shall I take the blame? Uh, only part of the blame. You know, I think that in this business, uh, uh, that each of us is sort of like a, a workman who laid down a big block, and after a while you have a cathedral. And any person can stand there and say, I built the cathedral. But you know you're putting your block on top of someone else's block, who in turn has put his block on top there. So it's very very awkward to take more credit for the whole cathedral when all you did was lay down a couple of stones. This is the way America and the world got its first televised look inside the White House. Mrs. Kennedy's 1962 tour made the administration appear somehow more accessible. 
that this window used to be the door in the olden days. All the carriages would come to the south entrance and people would come up the stairs because Pennsylvania Avenue wasn't paved until the Civil War. This is where they all came in. In its day, this was hailed as a major communications breakthrough, taking the White House to the public through the modern miracle of television. That's so complicated. I, I don't know. I just think that everything in the White House should be the best, the entertainment that's given here. This is how you can tour the White House today. You know, so it's just point and click. There's no typing, there's no funny language. Um, and we have a, this is a very powerful page. This is the entire cabinet uh, of the United States government. Jock Gill there's is the first person in history image. to there's be in charge of a president's internet icon. site. With the click of a uh, mouse from almost anywhere yeah, in the world, you can now image. tour the White House or contact any and major U.S. government agency. We can now say, well, I have an issue with the Treasury Department, or I'm curious about the Treasury Department. What can I learn about the Treasury Department? So I click on the Treasury Department, and now I'm turning, I'm going, literally going to the Treasury Department computers, and I'm literally turning this computer into a branch of the Treasury Office. Jock Gill has just broken into the Treasury Department. But it could be in Maine, it could be It is sophisticated in internet California, sites Alaska, like this one that are setting the standard for the way we will all soon communicate with our governments. And, and it's already being studied in Canada and by several European countries. But I might be very much interested in, well, who works at Treasury? And what we're starting to do here is to give the government a face and a name. And we'll, let's just say, you know, Ron Noble. I saw him on the TV news the other day talking about something. I can't remember, what does Ron Noble do? So come on, there we go. Uh, so I can look at Ron and, and read his job description, see his picture, and uh, see what he's doing for me as a taxpayer. Uh, and in the future, I'll be able, if Ron Noble is the government worker that I need to contact, I'll be able to contact him directly. Uh, if I'm looking at my veterans' benefits, if I'm looking at my Medicare and Medicaid, uh, I'll be able to deal with my caseworker directly. I'll be able to have a picture, I'll be able to have a contact point, a telephone number, a surface mail address, an email address, uh, so that we can get the government down to a one-to-one -one relationship. It was Washington that led the way to the creation of the Internet. It did so through an organization called ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're the people who brought us the stealth bomber. ARPA was a, is a very interesting organization. It's. Uh, it's sort of loosey-goosey, it was made up of heavily of academicians and uh, research institutions. So the things were done not, not by a very formal uh, process, but uh, groups of people with common interests working together. It was the loosey-goosey ARPA that funded some of the best computer minds in America through the 1960s and 70s. For they still had to come up with a way for the generals, and the generals' computers, to talk to each other. The computer industry had evolved in a world of technological babble. Different computers spoke different languages, had different systems and protocols. ARPA was still investing heavily in the hope that the scientists could come up with a technique to connect computer networks together in a way that it could survive a nuclear attack. Computer folklore has it that the solution was eventually figured out in the back of an envelope by a young Stanford professor named Vinton Cerf. In this case, the folklore is true. The story is that, that in, uh, the in 1973, I sat down doodling uh, in a hotel room in, what I was, or in, a, in the lobby. And what what I Cerf came up with was a gateway device, a translator, which could take packets of information from one system and let them flow through the other systems in a limited yeah. network. It was the realization that we needed this thing called a gateway. Vinton Cerf had placed the next major building blocks on the cathedral of the internet. But his solution still raised the usual question. How the hell does this work? Uh, I think probably the easiest metaphor for me to offer people is to think a little bit about the way postcards work in the postal system. Imagine that a packet is a postcard. Now, what do we know about postcards? Well, they have source addresses. They have a from address. They have destination addresses, the to address. And uh, they have some content. And they may have some other information on them. There's a postage stamp, for example, that says how much it costs to get them from one place to another. And they have a certain finite size. 
um, imagine that you're trying to communicate with somebody and, uh, and you have only postcards to use. We call postcards in the internet, we call them datagrams. And the reason we call them datagrams is datagrams have from addresses, they have two addresses, they have a finite amount of data. And uh, when you toss them into the system, they may or may not make it, which is certainly true of postcards or anything else. Uh, and certainly if you throw a bunch of them in to the postal system, they don't come out in the same order that they were thrown in. And they may take different paths to get there. Some may go by truck, some may go by plane. That's very similar to the way packets work in a, or datagrams work in an internet. Surf's postcards were now being sent on what was called the ARPANET. But it was a very exclusive club. The original network connected computers at UCLA, the University of Utah, University of California at Santa Barbara, and here at Stanford. Rick Adams was one of the early programmers on the ARPANET. In the early days, you had to be a uh, Department of Defense uh, employee or contractor to get on the, to, the, to the internet or the ARPANET in those days. Then the, uh, the early ARPANET users started moving to non-DOD facilities and they missed their ARPANET tool. Uh, and so they, they were looking for ways to continue using the tools that they were used to doing to do their jobs. Then they would move to, uh, from, from non-DOD sponsored universities into industry research labs and again would miss the tools that they had. And as they just kept moving onward, you got almost a geometric growth and demand for this. By the mid-1980s, the military had dropped out of the ARPANET to create their own network. And now more and more universities were lining up to join what was now being called the Internet. Word was beginning to leak out that this was a whole new way of gathering and exchanging information. The Internet is a, is a 25-year-old overnight success. It's, uh, it's taken a long time to get to this level of growth. And the, the phenomenon you've seen in the last year is really just the last year of a you know, another doubling type of thing, but it's now gotten to the point where doubling a very large number is a, a very, a very large number. Computers, which had been turning up in schools and offices, were now making their way into the home. They were fast becoming standard household equipment. So if you added up the value of all the software, it's more than 200. But there was still one major hurdle. Finding your way through the net still required some knowledge of how it worked. To the uninitiated, it was still a confusing morass of information with no starting point and no map. This is a uh, 56 kilobit channel bank. Each of these blue labels has the equivalent of one voice grade line or 64 kilobits of data. This is what most people are afraid of when they first approach the internet. People like Rick Adams, who speak a language all their own. Of the voice grade channels. Uh, the T1 cards are then aggregated up into the uh, patch panel here. Their sentences are peppered with phrases and numbers that are pure gibberish to the rest of us. There's 250 megabit entrances into here. One of them is split out into the, the uh, one megabit channels over here. This the is the world that Rick Adams inhabits, and this is the language he speaks. But hang in for a minute. It'll all become clear. Uh, all of this information is aggregated into this single yellow fiber down there. What he's really telling us is that in the time it takes to blink, an entire library of information can flow through these wires and cables, 52,000 words a second. On that tiny little strand. Wires and cables are the lifeblood of Adams' company, Alternet, based in Virginia. It was Adams who pioneered the concept of providing a commercial link to the internet. Think of Alternet and the other service providers as phone companies. Alternet is now one of the fastest growing companies in America. We're about a $15 million company this year. Uh, we're looking to do on the order of 40 million next year, uh, 75 to $100 million in 1996. Our growth rate is so fast, we really have no idea how fast we could grow if, if we were capable of it. No one knows the size of the market. It's a new market. We don't know if it if being a hundred, if a hundred million dollar company could be a hundred percent of the market, or it could be two percent of the market. Are we on schedule for the uh, move to the new building? Yeah, it starts 4 p.m. on Friday. One of the people here uses uh, Eric the, uh, Clapton as an example. I mean, he went out and just wanted to be the best guitar player in the world, and as a side effect, he made a huge amount of money. If he'd have gone out and tried to be a phenomenally successful, rich guitar player, he probably would have been a dismal failure. So I think that's, that's very true of the internet industry and the PC industry and a lot of things like that. Now, eight or ten years from now, 
uh, things would change radically and it would be a big business area. But certainly the first five to ten years of it uh, was, was people having fun trying to change the world, do prove something that was technically possible that other people said couldn't be done. The connection the service provider provides lets you use as much or as little of the net as you wish for one monthly charge. For individuals right now, prices vary, but typically it's around $20 a month. Now the uh, telephone number I'm going to go to is 212 They also usually provide a selection of free software that permits you to use the net in various ways. Each different software application lets you do different things, but the most popular application by far is email. Everyone with an email address, which your service provider can arrange, can receive or send mail through their computer. It can connect with anyone on the system and has no long distance charges. The internet becomes your post office, your computer becomes your mailbox, and your writing desk. It's deceptively simple. Type the address, type the message, and click. Last year on the internet, this happened six billion times. I find it, in general, uh, largely preferable to the telephone. I can, I can send a piece of electronic mail to someone at any time without ever fear of interrupting them, disturbing them, or anything else. Uh, I can respond to electronic mail at my convenience. I can, I can do it from home. I can do it from work. Uh, I work with a fair number of people in other countries. I don't have to worry about time zones. I can, I can send them a piece of mail at 3 o'clock in the afternoon knowing it's 3 a.m. in Japan, and I don't have to worry about disturbing them. When they get into work at 8 a.m., they'll see my mail, I'll respond in whatever timely manner they want, and again, they don't have to worry about uh, disturbing me. It's been a very, very effective tool just from the ease of use. The service provider will also usually include access to the various news groups on the net. News groups began when individuals with specific interests would create a file in which others could share. People who joined in the news groups kept each other up to date on whatever it was they shared an interest in. The news groups, now on every subject imaginable, have proliferated like rabbits. This came in today, new, new groups today. Portugal, New Brunswick, Netherlands, New Brunswick. FJ is Japan. Uh, so that's in Kanji. Across 10,000 today, 10,047 active news groups as of right now. It was 9,000 something the last time I looked. Uh, you know, I don't know how anyone could possibly keep up with this stuff on any rational basis. I can't. There's no limit to what is available in the news groups, and there's no restriction on what an internet surfer can add to it. ballerina in New Zealand can advise a dance fan in Halifax how to protect her slippers, while a dancer in Florida can talk about the dangers of using socks over your shoes. Not recommended. When the internet first came online, it relied on a population who could find their way into each individual computer. If you didn't know where to look, looking became a major chore. For people who were beginning to discover the net, this was a major stumbling block. It was overcome in 1991 by the programmers at the University of Minnesota who introduced software called Gopher. The project leader was Mark McCahill. It's the one that my mom and dad can use. It was the first project that was easy to explain to mom and dad. I could show them what it was and they said, oh yeah, I can see why I, I might even want to use this. Uh, before Gopher there wasn't an easy way of having this sort of big distributed system where there were seamless pointers between stuff on one machine and another machine. You had to know the name of this machine and if you wanted to go over here you had to know its name. Gopher takes care of all that stuff for you so navigating around Gopher is easy. It's point and click typically. So it's something that anybody could use to find things. It was also very easy to put information up so a lot of people started running servers themselves and it was the first of the easy-to-use 
no muss, no fuss. You can just crawl around and look for information, tools. It was the one that wasn't written for techies. The idea is you're presented with a list of things and you can select from that list of things that leads you to more items. Typically, you set this up so that you can start out with sort of a general overview or general structure of a bunch of information, choose the items that you're interested in to move into a more specialized area, and then either look at items by browsing around and finding some documents or submitting searches. One of the things that Gopher lets you do is ask some questions of a server. Would you please tell me items that match this? So it's basically a hierarchical organization of information that combines browsing, where you pick the things you're interested in, and searching. Um, accommodates a bunch of different kinds of documents. It could be a text document that you get when you look at the thing you found in the end, or it could be a picture, or a digital movie, or a sound, or that kind of thing. So the idea is some structure to an information space that you can navigate around. That's what we try to do. Gopher provided a text-driven system that became one of the major landmarks in the history of the Internet. But at the University of Illinois, they were preparing for the step beyond Gopher by developing software known as Mosaic. Where Gopher had been the program your mom and dad could use, Mosaic was the one for your baby brother. And for the rest of us. It was Mosaic that spawned the growth of the World Wide Web by bringing what's called hypertext to the screen. Instead of linking through file folders, you could now click on individual words and pictures. Since 1986, the National Science Foundation Backbone Network has expanded and upgraded to provide an information superhighway. Academic tradition demanded that the software developed at the universities be shared and not carry a price tag. So in the culture of the internet, Gopher, Mosaic, and most of the other applications are essentially still available free of charge. But that doesn't mean there isn't going to be any money to be made on the internet. And if everything goes according to plan, this young man is about to make a big chunk of it. Mark Andreessen might well be on the way to becoming America's next zillionaire. He's 24 years old. Even in Silicon Valley, where nothing ever happens slowly, the growth of Mark Andreessen's company has left industry veterans shaking their heads in disbelief. Andreessen and a handful of other students, who had a hand in the birth of Mosaic, have moved here from Illinois with one major ambition, a major software assault on the Internet. Right, but it's going to be completely correct to totally trash the build once the tree opens again. All right, all right, let's do that this. Depends if on they're successful, they will all become immensely rich. In the high-pressure world of software development, the payoffs can be huge. We think this really is the information superhighway. We think this is the medium that people will use to access information. Um, we think that uh, a lot of companies are going to be doing business on the network and are going to be offering goods and services to people over the network. Uh, and I think you're going to see very widespread growth there over the next few years. Andreessen was one of the principal creators of Mosaic. Now he and his colleagues have brought out a program which has been recognized as another major step up the software ladder, a commercial version of Mosaic called Netscape. Oh, I know what we want to do. Oh, this is great. OK, let's see. You'll love this. Yeah, here what I'm doing is I'm, uh, here I'm at a server called the Bay Area Restaurant Guide. And um, this is a business that's running on the internet now that organizes all the different restaurants in the, in the California Bay Area. Um, and it allows us to search through the, uh, the restaurant listings um, and um, indexes of the restaurants in several different ways. Um, so one way we can do it is by going into an interactive map, uh, picking a location um, in the bay by pointing and clicking. Um, and it'll take us in further. And uh, what we can do is we can progressively uh, explore the Bay Area graphically until we get to uh, the location that we know we uh, want to go. So we'll go in a few levels deeper, um, start looking at the streets themselves. Here we're in Menlo Park. Uh, let's go a little further into Menlo Park. Okay, so now I've uh, picked a location um, where maybe I am or maybe I know I'll be having a business meeting or, or where I'll be um, going out to eat tomorrow. And um, I can search for um, every Chinese restaurant um, in a three mile radius um, by selecting search parameters and by um, pressing a button called search. So now it's going to go to this computer out on the net, and it's going to do a search for all the Chinese restaurants within a three-mile area of, of where I ended up. And in fact, here I have a list of the 12 restaurants that are in that area. 
I can click on a link, um, jump to information about a particular restaurant. And in fact, I can also read reviews that have been submitted by um, other people who have visited that restaurant. And if I go to that restaurant, if I like it or I don't like it, I can come back to the server and I can post my own review of the restaurant. Andreessen's Netscape will do a lot more than help you find crispy chicken in San Francisco. It has the capacity to open the net to business by eventually providing a new level of security and access. This will permit things like credit card transactions. The payoff will come as Netscape captures more and more of the market, enticing corporate America to use it as the cornerstone for any information it wants to put on the World Wide Web. Getting to that payoff has a way of filling up Mark Andreessen's 24-year-old days. This week I flew out on the red eye Monday night to Atlanta, flew back on Tuesday night, uh, flew out on the red eye to Washington Wednesday night, flew back last night, um, and now I'm doing this. Um, it depends. It really, it really depends. Um, I travel a lot. Um, I uh, you know, spend a lot of time um, as, as sort of sales and marketing. Um, I don't write code. Um, I spend some time on design, I spend some time working with the engineers and so on. Um, and I just try to do, you know, I just try to do what, what, what's needed to make the company successful. The content is endless. Netscape has, for example, set up a camera in front of the office fish tank. It's already a big hit on the net. And everything you want to know about Netscape fish is available with a simple click of a mouse. You can even find out who came up with this ridiculous idea in the first place. And if people are prepared to watch digital fish, can big business be far behind? Suddenly it seems that every major corporation in the continent is elbowing its way onto the internet. And every one of these corporations has to come through here, to a nondescript office in suburban Washington. For it is here, in this little box, that the internet gets as close as it comes to a head office. For in this box, every internet address in the world is recorded and stored. Obviously no two addresses can be the same, but with the growing number of organizations coming into the net, the new currency here is a short, catchy address. Scott Williamson, at the Internet Registration Service, is the man who has to make sure there are no duplications. We're seeing uh, you know, requests come in from a service provider, someone who's going to be in the information service for every common name like sport.com and, and car.com and hotel.com. Uh, we're trying to, there really aren't policies to stop it. And, and that's, I think you're going to see policies real soon to, to kind of slow it down a little bit. There are only so many common names that you can uh, reserve. All right, let's see if this is registered yet. The registration service is getting about 2,000 calls a month from corporations anxious to capture a recognizable and generic name. There aren't many left. Sooner or later it's got to slow down, I would guess, but uh, if you look at the percentage of, uh, of companies that are on the internet right now compared to how many companies there really are, it's a scary, uh, scary thing to look at, especially in this position. Corporate America has arrived on the net. That's better. <laughs> this is the daily editorial board meeting of Time magazine. The journalists here have to decide which stories will appear in Time this week. During the next four days, they'll write their articles, select their photographs, prepare the magazines for printing, and then send it out by road, rail, air, and satellite. Apart from the satellite, they've been doing it this way since the beginning of Time. But even Time is not standing still when it comes to the Internet. It's being led there by executive Walter Isaacson. So I think up until uh, this new electronic age dawned, we thought of ourselves as packages of a product. We made a Time magazine, which had 50, 60 pages of editorial content, and those same pages went to all 21 million of our readers. Now we have to look at upon ourselves as, as journalists who gather large amounts of information and who make it easy for readers to get where they want when they want it. So we may be gathering information that only a certain subset of our readers is going to use, uh, but that's something we can do by using electronic publishing and the internet. 
Secondly, it gives you the chance to go to different levels. So you might want to do a story about Newt Gingrich where you've interviewed Newt Gingrich, and in that story you put in three or four quotes from an hour-long interview with Newt Gingrich. Now you can have a little line that says, in an interview with Time Magazine, Newt Gingrich said, and that, there can be a little hyperlink on that line, a little underlined thing. You click on it and you can see the entire interview. And then you might want to give people even more, such as a big biography of Newt Gingrich or the text of all of his speeches in the congressional record. We could link to that. So not only do we think in a linear package fashion, like here's a story we're going to tell from the beginning to the end in two pages, we also think about ways to make it deeper for people who want to go deeper into it. These are the magazine pages available from Time Warner. No trucks, no planes, no trains. Craig there. Bromberg is one of the online editors. Here's the Vanessa Williams story. There's a hot new spider woman on Broadway. And there she is. And she's beautiful, too. And you really know it when you see the full page photograph. It's all pointing and clicking. There is nothing else. My mom can do this. And if, you, if your printer is right on your desk, boy, it's instant gratification. I mean, this is pretty, pretty darn good. But Time Warner already has some established competition. There is, for example, International Teletimes, an award-winning alternate magazine available only in cyberspace. Its copy editor lives in Japan, its head writer is in Austria, and it's published out of this house in suburban Vancouver. Its founder and publisher works on Teletimes as soon as he's finished his homework. But is 17-year-old Ian Voidovich trembling in his boots because of Time's entry into the marketplace? Not exactly. I honestly actually haven't seen their site yet. Um, it's on my backlist of things to do. Um, but um, I don't think so. Um, there's not so much competition as as, um, um, as the effect that they're they're going to have on the internet as a whole might be some uh, uh, a reason for concern. Time Inc. is on a steep upgrade path to become a completely digital company. That's a complicated complicated endeavor, but the enthusiasm is gung ho. We're going to conquer this world. We are the first to do it. There are no other major media companies out there that are really pioneering this. What we're trying to get is um, um, not the journalist, but the, the real person who's living and experiencing the news, writing about what's happening. Um, not the, you know, the foreign correspondent who's just flown in the day before and, and is bringing all his, his, his Western um, you know, uh, influences and, and, and uh, biases into, into whatever he's reporting. So. That's what we want to get at with Teletimes and, uh, and Time Warner. Uh, they don't scare me. The internet has become the gold rush of cyberspace, a new Klondike to which adventurers from all over the world are flocking. Magazines dealing with the digital revolution are now the hottest properties in publishing and are spawning electronic spin-offs which in turn are producing staggering subscription lists. Hot Wired's weekly growth is bringing in numbers unheard of in traditional publishing. We're getting a good response. We're getting subscribers um, at about 10,000 a week. 10,000 new subscribers a week, taking part in a whole new way of reading, of publishing, and a completely new way of advertising. What you're witnessing here is a media revolution where advertisers present as much information as they can and the reader decides how much to click on. Hotwired was the first publication in cyberspace with this type of commercial sponsorship. Jonathan Starr is one of the original creators of Hotwired. As an advertiser, certainly what you're really interested in is impacting people's purchasing habits or at least their information seeking habits and making sure that uh, what they actually find out is about you, about your company, about your products and then have an opportunity to buy those things if, if they so desire. Um, the net allows you to do that and um, 
the way our, our advertisements on Hotwired are set up. You can come in, you can have a little bit of a look around, see if you're interested in whatever a particular sponsor um, has out there. And if you want to pursue that and give them your name and address and sign up for their mailing list, or um, if you want to um, you know, seek more information directly from the company, you have an immediate and direct pipeline to do that. And um, you know, it it's beats telemarketing, what can I say? And I think uh, advertisers have figured that out, and they're really excited about it, um, more because it offers them a direct mechanism to uh, stay in touch with the people who are interested in what they're doing, and I think are willing to pay somewhat of a premium on the per individual basis in order to have that direct of a connection. I think you can continue the same size and it's a list. But not everyone is interested in turning out a publication filled with ads. Personal home pages are flooding the net. When he's not working as a reporter for Hot Wired, 19-year-old Justin Hall spends his time putting out Justin's links from the underground. He averages 10 hours a day on the net. I used to spend six or eight hours a day playing computer games. And that was all right, but it got it got to be pretty bad after a while because they don't give you anything back. This, like I, you know, I go out on the net and I find something cool and I write a little blurb about it and I put it up and people find that blurb, and then they write back and they say thank you, that was great. Like here's what I'm doing. Check this out, Justin, because I think you'd like this as well. And then that's really exciting for me. It's 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 back and forth. It's it's living. It's really. It can't be too. I mean, you know, it's life. It can't be too much. There are, at this point, thousands of personal home pages. I mean, without any denigration of anybody, this isn't meant to be pejorative in the slightest, any college kid with an Ethernet connection into their, their little dorm room can have a beautiful page, and lots of them do. Home pages may be simple entertainment for thousands of school kids, but the bright ones have realized there's something fundamentally revolutionary about this technology. It creates an even playing field for everyone, from the corporate giants of New York to a 17-year-old publisher in Vancouver. When I first got into uh, the internet and started up Teletimes, um, I was you know, quite surprised with uh, the amount of uh, power that I had. Um, this is not something I could have done uh, in the print medium. Uh, first of all, I, personally, I don't have enough business, business experience to, to keep a, a magazine running, you know, uh, without without uh, losing money, but uh, but also simply interacting with other people, uh, the fact that you don't have the initial um, uh, that that first impression that's there, um, it's all based on on what you have to say, which is something. There's something very romantic about that. Um, it's it's uh, you're judged basically on on more uh, on who you are than than how you appear. And that's, that's very special. There was a cartoon in The New Yorker that said, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And, and the fact that The New Yorker could use the word internet as the punchline in a cartoon was, to me, the, the defining popularization of the internet. Uh, it was actually well known enough that people could use, the pun use that as a punchline in a joke. On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And that, that, I mean, that captures it beautifully. That's, that's, that's what it is being not married yet, implying that they will be married yeah. or they should Even the young and the hip have trouble when it actually comes to defining the internet. So, like, saying that they're unmarried, no one has really established if it's a place, a community, a library, a research center, a mail system. The only thing that everyone agrees on is that it's grown out of control. This, this thing has long since grown from, from the small town it once was, where people metaphorically left their doors unlocked to the gigantic metropolis where there are all kinds of people out there, including people that don't mean you well. While the net has been booming, it's also been developing a dark side. For behind seemingly innocent addresses can the con men and flim flam artists, child molesters and pornographers. Each of them is anonymous, as they choose to be. Some people are, are weird, you know, and some people have interests that other people think they shouldn't have. They're all part of that fabric, and we can't ignore that. Um, and so people worry about pornography on the network, and they worry about flaming and, and uh, harassment and things like that. Other media uh, have the same problem. This is not unique to this particular environment. I mean, people get on 
cars, getting cars on the infrastructure of the highway system, and we kill ourselves, 50,000 of us a year in the U.S. Um, so we do dumb things, and we do illegal things, and that's going to happen in the Internet environment, probably already has. You know, the, uh, the flim flam man is out there trying to sell you snake oil on a bridge. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that you shut down the, rail, uh, the, uh, the automobile system. It doesn't mean that you shut down the telephone system. It doesn't mean that you shut down all the printing presses. It may mean that you make laws that say some things are illegal, and if you're caught doing them, we will prosecute. Um, and uh, we look for uh, ways to uh, minimize opportunity to abuse these kinds of technologies. But you can never completely eliminate it, certainly not by technical means. And so the growth of the net has brought with it the inevitable problems of society in general. But they won't hinder its development, for the experimental labs are well on the way to finalizing the next big leap. And it is perhaps only fitting that the next building blocks in the evolution of the internet are already being put in place by the man who laid down the very first stones, Paul Barron. The engineers have long recognized that what they call the tails of the net, or the last mile problem, is the final remaining handicap with the technology. They can send a message around the world in a millisecond, but getting it those last few steps into each house is a labor, money, and time-consuming venture. Among Paul Barron's new projects is a device that would link us all to the net by going through the cable television networks. With this little black box, your computer would become your TV. Barron has recognized that utilizing the already existing cable connections may be the simplest solution to the last mile problem. Paul Barron's other major innovation is a device that has the potential to turn any street light into a relay station to carry digital internet communications. The wired world will become wireless as access to the internet would no longer need a plug, which might explain why investment is rushing to Paul Barron's door, capitalizing his new company at a hundred million dollars. I have most of my fun starting things now. And uh, what I try to do is uh, get them started um, and then hire somebody smarter than myself to run them and get the hell out of the way. The internet has come down a long road since Paul Barron wanted to let the generals talk to each other so they wouldn't rush out and drop the first bomb. We're in Finland now. Oh, you can do the map, do the map. It's in Finnish. Oh, that's right. And the grandfather of the internet seems content with the way it's evolved. Yes, I think it's a good thing. Uh, but one can never be sure until a couple hundred years have gone by and seeing whether it hasn't led in some direction that we hadn't planned. Uh, yes, I think it's great, you know, being able to have the whole world be the village and to be able to communicate with anyone and be able to pick from all the people in the world that subset with the same common interest as yourself. And it's a unifying force. I think when people get to know one another, I think there's less stress and tension at the, at the borders. The white parts of this map represent the places where the internet does not yet exist. Everywhere else has either access to the full net, email, or the beginnings of a computer-to-computer -computer network. In the time it's taken to watch this show, at least a thousand new subscribers have signed on. Every new player will have the capacity to add to the culture of the net, to take part in its minute-by-minute -minute development. If you don't have access to the internet, the best place to start is probably your local computer store. If you do have access to the World Wide Web, we've prepared a site for you. Here are the steps to get there. Using Mosaic-style software, open URL, type in this address, and hit Enter. You'll find more background and a way to visit the various sites you've seen on understanding the internet. We're going to see a wide-scale revolution of interactivity um, that is unanticipated. And we're going to create an entirely non-sequential universe of images, sounds, texts, 
swamping the world. If you think you've got information overload right now, just wait. I mean, it is going to be frightening. It's important that, that commercial, the commercialization of the net does not take it in, in, a, in sort of a bad direction in, in something new. I mean, we don't want another form of TV. No offense. <laughs>